announce to him his approaching end and to advise him to receive the last sacraments. Everyone refuses to tell him for fear of frightening him. But in the meantime, although no warning is given him of his death, the dying man nevertheless, seeing all the family in disorder, the frequent medical consultations, and the numberless and violent remedies that are adopted, is filled with confusion and terror, and amidst continual attacks of fear, remorse, and distrust, says within himself, Alas, who knows, but the end of my days is come. What then will be his feelings when he really receives the announcement of his death? What distress when he hears the words, Sir, your illness is mortal. You must receive the sacraments. Make your peace with God and bid farewell to the world. O oh, fool that I have been, the poor sufferer will then say. I might have been a saint with all the lights and opportunities which God has given me. I might have led a life of happiness in the grace of God. And now what remains of me, of the many years that I have passed, but torments, distrust, fears, and accounts to render to God. And hardly can I hope to save my soul. And when will he say this? When the oil of the lamp is nearly consumed, and the scene of this world is about to close, when he is already in sight of the two eternities, happy and unhappy, when he is near that last gasp, upon which depends his being in bliss or despair forever, as long as God is God. What terror will it then be for him to think and say, This morning I am alive. This evening most likely I shall be dead. Today I am in this room. Tomorrow I shall be in the grave. And my soul, where will it be? What terror when he sees the candle prepared, when he perceives the cold sweat of death appear, when he hears his relations ordered to withdraw from his room and return no more, when his sight begins to fail and his eyes to darken, what terror, for death is already approaching. Death viewed according to the senses terrifies and causes fear, but when viewed with the eyes of faith it consoles and becomes desirable. What, says St. Augustine, is a continuation of life but a continuation of suffering? Our present life is not given for our repose but for our labor, and by labor to merit eternal life. The torments that afflict sinners at the hour of death do not afflict the saints. The saints are not afflicted at leaving the goods of this world since they have kept their hearts detached from them. The present life is a continual war with hell in which we are all in constant danger of losing our Lord and our God. This danger caused St. Peter of Alcantara to say when he was dying to a religious who in assisting him touched him, My brother, keep away from me because I am still living and in peril of being damned. This danger likewise caused St. Teresa to be comforted each time that she heard the clock strike, rejoicing that another hour of combat had passed. For she said, In every moment of life I may sin and lose God. What a special consolation will it then be to remember the honors paid to the Mother of God, the rosaries recited, the visits to her altars, the fasts on Saturdays, the having frequented her confraternities. Mary is called Virgin Most Faithful. Oh, how great is her fidelity in consoling her faithful servants at the hour of death. A certain person devoted to the Blessed Virgin said in dying, You cannot conceive what a consolation at the hour of death is the thought of having served our Blessed Lady. If you could but know what happiness I experience in having served this dear mother, I know not how to express it. St. Bonaventure says, He who neglects the service of the Blessed Virgin will die in his sins. He who does not invoke thee, O Lady, will never get to heaven. Not only will those from whom Mary turns her countenance not be saved, but there will be no hope of their salvation. No one can be saved without the protection of the Blessed Virgin Mary. St. Alphonsus said, If you persevere till death in true devotion to Mary, your salvation is certain. And St. Louis de Montfort said, A true child of Mary has never been lost. On the particular judgment, Let us consider the soul's appearance before God, the accusation, the examination, and the sentence. At first, with regard to the appearance of the soul before the judge. It is a common opinion among theologians that the particular judgment takes place at the very moment in which a man expires. 
and that in the very place where the soul is separated from the body, she is judged by Jesus Christ. Criminals have been known to fall into a cold sweat when brought into the presence of an earthly judge. What a grief is it to a child or a subject to behold a parent or a prince seriously offended. But oh, how much greater a pain will it be for that soul to behold Jesus Christ, whom she despised during life. So following death, a person will have an immediate particular judgment, and the soul will be sent to heaven, hell, or purgatory. St. Paul tells us in Philippians 2.13 to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And our Blessed Mother tells us, His mercy is from generation to generation on those that fear Him. On the fewness of the saved. Several of the fathers of the church considered that from the fact that at the time of the deluge only eight persons were saved, at the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah only four, and of the 600,000 able men who departed out of Egypt, not more than two reached the promised land, the others all dying in the desert, it may be concluded that the number of the elect among Christians will be proportionately small. Here are some of the teachings of the fathers, doctors, and saints of the church concerning the final destiny of people. It is certain that few are saved, St. Augustine. The majority of men shall not see God, St. Justin the Martyr. Those who are saved are in the minority, St. Thomas Aquinas. The greater part of men choose to be damned rather than love Almighty God, St. Alphonsus. Among adults, there are few saved because of sins of the flesh. With the exception of those who die in childhood, most men will be damned, St. Regimus of Reims. Out of a hundred thousand sinners who continue in sin until death, scarcely one will be saved, says St. Jerome. If you die outside the Catholic Church, you will go to hell. Pope Eugene IV, in the year 1441, in the ex cathedra of Bull, Cantate Domino at the Council of Florence stated the following. The Holy Roman Church firmly believes, professes, and preaches that all those who are outside the Catholic Church, not only pagans, but also Jews or heretics and schismatics, cannot share in eternal life and will go into the everlasting fire which was prepared for the devil and his angels unless they are joined to the church before the end of their lives and that the unity of this ecclesiastical body is of such importance that only those who abide in it do the church's sacraments contribute to salvation and do fasts, almsgivings, and other works of piety and practices of the Christian militia productive of eternal rewards. And that nobody can be saved, no matter how much he has given away in alms, and even if he has shed blood in the name of Christ, unless he has persevered in the bosom and unity of the Catholic Church. The majority of Catholics will go to hell. The greater number of Christians today are damned. The destiny of those dying on one day is that very few, not as many as ten, went straight to heaven. Many remain in purgatory, and those that were cast into hell were as numerous as snowflakes in midwinter. Blessed Anna Maria Taghi. Why do most Catholics go to hell? Bad confessions damn the majority of Christians. St. Teresa of Avila. Most priests go to hell. I do not speak rashly, but as I feel and think, I do not think many priests are saved, but that those who perish are more numerous. St. John Chrysostom. St. Vincent de Paul said, I tremble when I think of the number of souls that live in a constant state of damnation. Children and young people go to hell. St. Gregory the Great relates that a child five years old who had arrived at the use of reason was seized by a devil for having uttered a blasphemy and carried into hell. Another boy of eight died after his first sin and was lost forever. The Holy Mother of God revealed to that great servant of God, Benedicta of Florence, that a girl of 12 was damned after her first sin. The most graphic description of hell was given by Our Lady of Fatima to three shepherd children in the year 1917 in Portugal. The following is what the children saw. Our Lady opened her hands and rays of light seemed to penetrate the earth, and we saw as it were a sea of fire 
plunged in this fire were demons and souls in human form, like trans-